Okay, welcome to uh, this video on photosynthesis. Let's start by looking at the word itself. It comes from the Greek photo, which means light, and synthesis, which means building. So we're building using light. But what are we building? Well, let's have a look at the reaction. This balanced symbol equation shows that plants need carbon dioxide and water, and they produce glucose and oxygen. You might have noticed that if you switch the reactants and products around, you have the respiration equation. In fact, the plants use some of the glucose they make from photosynthesis for respiration, and this provides them with the energy they need for growth and repair and all that other stuff. So plants use carbon dioxide and water to build glucose molecules. So what's so special about glucose? As well as using glucose for energy, a plant can store glucose in the form of starch or fats. It can be converted into proteins for growth and repair. It can be joined into long, tough strands to form cellulose for cell walls. Um, <clears throat> in most cells, you find structures called chloroplasts, which contain the green pigment chlorophyll. And this is the site of photosynthesis. This is where the photosynthesis reaction takes place. So where would you find most chloroplasts? Well, if this is where photosynthesis happens and light is required for this, the most naturally uh, obvious place to find them would be at the top of the leaf. And you do. When you do a, a transverse section of a leaf, you look at a leaf into, under a microscope, there's a, a layer on top called the palisade layer. This is where the, the light is at its strongest. Um, and so this is where you find the highest concentration of chloroplasts. Underneath this is a region called the spongy mesophyll. This has got lots of air gaps to allow the diffusion of gases in and out of the leaf. Now let's have a look at some uh, really clever experiments, quite simple but clever experiments that have been done. In the middle of the 17th century, Jean-Baptiste van Helmont decided to test the Greek idea that a plant gets more massive because it uses the minerals from the soil. So basically they thought that the plant ate the soil around its roots. Now obviously, if that took place, there'd be a great big hole surrounding the plant. Um, a giant sequoia, one of the most massive objects, massive living things in the world, doesn't eat the soil around its roots. You can imagine how big the hole would be around its roots. Um, and that, that was obviously wrong. So this, this, this guy, Van Helmont, he did an experiment with a willow tree. He measured the mass of a willow tree and the soil that it was growing in. After five years, the plant had gained about 164 pounds. Now, then he measured the mass of the soil, and it was basically the same. Nothing had happened. So this plant had not been munching away on the soil around it. It didn't get all of that 164 pounds from minerals in the soil. So he concluded it must have been the water. That's the only thing. Since the soil was basically the same as it had been when he started the experiment, he concluded that the tree's weight gain must have come from water. Uh, that was a bit better than the Greek idea, but it was still incomplete. That was an incomplete conclusion, because most of the mass actually comes from carbon dioxide from the air. That giant sequoia starts off as a, as a seed, a few, a few grams, and it ends up as a hundreds of tons tree. Where does all that hundreds of tons of stuff come from? Well, it comes from the air. And that's amazing, if you think about it. The, the mass of a huge tree like that, most of that comes from the air. Um, let's have a look at another one. Joseph Priestley. Joseph Priestley carried out a really simple experiment that proved that plants produce oxygen. He put a mint plant in a closed container with a burning candle. That candle flame used up all the oxygen in the container and it went out. 27 days later, Priestley was able to relight that candle and that showed that plants produce some sort of gas that allows fuels to burn and that gas was oxygen. Now, let's talk about limiting factors. There are three main factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. They're light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature. <clears throat> one of these three, three things, light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature, one of these, th these three things will be a limiting factor. So, for example, a plant might have plenty of CO2 and warmth, but if that plant is in the shade, the rate of reaction will level off as it does in this graph. If you want to increase the rate of photosynthesis, you have to give it more of what it's lacking, in this case, light. Greenhouses are designed to give plenty of light and warmth to a plant, but some plant producers will also pump CO2 into their greenhouses to ensure really rapid growth. 
In this graph here you can see that with relatively higher levels of carbon dioxide and high temperatures, the rate of photosynthesis is highest. It might be here that light is the limiting factor. OK, that was a quick run through of the basics of photosynthesis. I hope you found it useful. As ever, any feedback is always appreciated. Thank you very much for watching.